Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Glue Stick channel, delving back into the archives, also known as packing boxes prior to moving to my new lair. I uncovered the original list of videos to be made, and today from that list I will be talking about one of DM Scotty's favourite critters, at least from his uh, games that I remember from a few years back, the Mites, and their distant relatives the Sniads or Pesties. Also, since they are so small I can fit even more into this video, I will be talking about the Germlane, also known as the Jinxkin or Bane Midges. I know many of you are going, the what? The, ming the mites have been around for a long time, um, originally seen in the pages of White Dwarf Magazine issue 6, and they were invented by none other than Ian Livingstone. Now, if you don't know who Ian Livingstone and Steve Jackson are, it brings me great pleasure to introduce you to these two legends who created the choose-your-own-adventure style fighting fantasy books. Loads of them, and I have to say, these books, well... Before I knew about Dungeons and Dragons, these were my fantasy world, and they they were are extremely popular. Essentially, you could read a page or two, and then you have a decision to make, and the options lead to other pages and other tracks that the story can take. If that sounds familiar, it's basically how all modern role-playing computer games are programmed. Every time you have some sort of menu of responses to an NPC, or every time you go to door one and not door two, you're playing within that sort of basic linear system. The man is a legend, co-creator for fighting, fighting uh, fantasy game books, co-founder for Games Workshop, and president and CEO of Edios Interactive and commander of the Order of the British Empire. I bet Gary Gygax would have got a kick out of being awarded a knighthood. Anyway, I digress. Mites are tiny humanoids. There are three races. Um, all three races are tiny humanoids, but they normally... You would expect some sort of exotic powers of the Fey or the um, the the Shadowfell or the upper or lower planes of the outer cosmology, but these tiny and pathetic creatures are almost entirely mundane. The Mites were perhaps once an offshoot of the Gremlins or some other Fey creature who became residents in the mortal prime material worlds, but even gnomes and elves have more connection to the Fey than the Mites do. Mites are a mere two feet in height. They have large heads with hooked noses and bat-like ears, giving their head a kind of a triangular shape. They have scrawny bodies and evil expressions, and, well, at least that's the only expression that big folk normally see. Their skin is almost entirely bald and warty, ranging in colour from a light grey to a bright violet. Most wear ragged clothing of some kind. They inhabit networks of very narrow tunnels above and below main dungeon corridors, and their scurrying feet and high-pitched twittering voices can often be heard by adventurers delving deep into lost ruins. Mites prefer, for obvious reasons, to stay out of sight. They avoid being seen directly and never openly attack. They attempt to ensnare the lone adventurer or unwary straggler um, using trapdoors, nets, tripwires, spikes, pitted springboards, uh, spiked springboards, bags of glue, and other such means. They'll um, even collapse corridors and things to to isolate people. Once they nab one of the big folk, they swiftly gag, blindfold, and bind them firmly with heaps of ropes, and then drag them away from their allies, preventing anyone coming to the rescue. These those captured by mites are thoroughly robbed, stripped down to their bare skin often bound uh, to a heavy rock, hung upside down or locked in a cramped cage and frequently soundly beaten. And then, sometime later, they're all returned, still naked, bruised and bleeding, hands bound in a sack over the head, dumped into the main corridor of the dungeon and at the mercy of wandering monsters who happen to catch scent of them, hear them stumbling around or just happen to run into them. The best way to deal with mites, as soon as you suspect there are any uh, around in large numbers and they're usually are in large numbers, is first to smoke them out of their tunnels, blocking or covering all of the other exits, which is um, difficult because they're always very well concealed by stacked up rocks. Mites are no threat to a small or medium humanoid by themselves. They are evil little shits who consider tormenting big folk to be the best kind of sport, but they are not generally murderous. They are justifiably worried about the vengeance of the big people. They don't eat meat of other humanoids, so killing them seems kind of pointless thing to do. Also, it would be the end of all their fun. They enjoy pestering, trapping, and beating the living shit out of those looming chubby halflings, dour humanless dwarves, arrogant greedy humans, and hoity-toity pointy-eared elves, and so on. They can feed a whole family for a month on just one week's worth of rations, the iron rations, carried by an adventurer. They can fashion all kinds of tools and implements from the precious coins, metal shields, the billowing capes, and the thousands of uh, links of metal in a coat of mail. Not a single scrap taken from a hostage is wasted, 
uh, though they're not very smart. Their tunnel, tunnels can be filled with scavenged and stolen loot. They're not smart. They're, they're lousy crafters. Kobolds leave them in a dust in terms of making complex traps. The best idea a mite usually has is to build a pit and make it look like the floor is still there, which they consider to be genius. They also observe how one of their worst enemies operate, the giant spiders. They've learned how to use web and rope to craft nets, which they'll drop onto victims from above quite frequently. Victims are always dragged through the narrow passages of their home to a central large chamber their house they house their king in. He's always the might equivalent of a mighty hero, and he will be perched on a tiny might throne, lording over his um, captives and ordering around his little people. The central chamber also houses the women and children, and an observant adventurer will note that the male mites have a central bone ridge on their skull that connects the bridge uh, to the bridge of their nose, which the females and children do not possess. Also, the males grow a little small goatee beard. Females are actually a lot more vicious than the males and will bite. The children will just scatter into the tunnels and hide. The large chamber is a shambles, an Aladdin's cave of junk, but they do have coins and larger objects such as lanterns strewn about, mostly intact and functional. The king is the only one who is allowed to play with any captured gems, which they do value. Um, he'll keep them in a chest or a bucket or a helmet or a cauldron next to his throne. Most objects are endlessly fidgeted with, and my curiosity is ravenous, probably because they really don't understand what things do and how big folk make things. And they think like flasks of oil and tinder boxes are wondrous items. They might find magic amulets. Um, you might find them just sort of gathering dust because the mites are afraid to mess with them and just throwing them into a hat, trash heap or just left it where it was after taking it off the victim. They wear their clothes nice and loose, um, which looks baggy and ridiculous, but actually helps them to escape grapples and get um, if they get caught in tight confines, which is quite common in a cave. They also love... Um, bones and the whole tribe will work very hard to drag a big monster skull into their central throne room to admire it and brag about it. Mites eat vermin. They dine on rats by preference, but they will eat spider eggs, fried maggots and grubs, cave beetles, snails and all kinds of edible fungus. They're omnivorous and have been known to boil and eat an entire suit of leather armor. All of the males in the tribe carry fuss over and spend many hours honing and perfecting their weighted clubs. They're quite obsessed with them. And it seems a lot of their simplistic chattering communication may be a lot of different words for club and clubbing. Any adventurer who has been captured by them will certainly tell you that they take their beatings to quite an art form and can keep someone alive yet pulverizing them for upwards of four days, which actually takes a fair bit of skill and experience. Mites are far, far from the top of the food chain. They are considered to be some sort of a lovely starter dish at the banquets of evil giants, particularly stone and fire giants, though cloud giants are also known to indulge, and, well, hill giants will eat damn near anything. The distant cousins of mites are the sniads, or pesties, who you can spot them by their height difference. They are on average two and a half feet tall, plus they have a full head of filthy hair and are a light brown colour. Sniads live in small, tight-knit family groups. They um, have actual marriages between individuals that last for life. Despite having no recognisable form of language, their chattering is entirely meaningless, even to scholars. Um, yet, they seem to communicate with the mites somehow. The reasons they are often found together is the Sniads are super greedy and absolutely love to steal things. They're very swift and agile little cut purses and use the distraction of the mites' attacks to dart in and rob a character blind. Mites don't really care that much for gold and silver. They like gems because they're pretty, but they leave the necklaces, coins and signet rings to the Sniads who hoard them feverishly. Sniads are actually even less aggressive than the mites. They don't really care to fight with larger humanoids at all. They can be easily restrained if you're swift enough to catch one, and any larger humanoid with a strength higher than, say, 12 can lock the sniad in a grip that they're just too weak to break free from. They, they will kick up a cacophonous screaming and squirm constantly and pathetically. This is mainly out of fright, and they dare not bite one of the larger folk, terrified that the big folk will bite back, because they don't know very well, they know very well that the most large monstrous humanoids will eat them, and they don't see much difference between any of the big folks, really. They're just all horrible big monsters to them. Finally, the germlane appear to be tineless, tiny humans, dressed in baggy clothing and leather helmets. They're, they're even smaller, they're like a foot tall. In fact, the clothing is their own saggy skin and pointed heads. Their limbs are knotted muscle, knotty, knotty muscled. Uh, their fingers, nails, and toenails are thick and filthy. They're, um, although the fingers and toes are very nimble. Their grey brown, warty hide blends in with the natural earth and stone, so they're hard to spot. And they wear rags or scraps of clothing as well, which, um, such as items 
the world. They basically camouflage themselves to with whatever scraps they pick up. They speak in high-pitched squeaks and twitters, and the speak may be mistaken for the sounds of a bat or rat. In fact, they can also converse with all sorts of bats and rats by normal, um, by both normal rats and monstrous rats, like giant rats. They're also known as jinxkin or bane midges. They are total cowards who only attack in ambush when they feel there is no serious chance of opposition. So they'll usually attack only the sick and injured, and even then wait until they're sleeping. They have weak eyesight and can see only about 40 feet in the dark, but they're very stealthy with the scuffling gait and tiny size. They're very hard to detect, even if you're looking for them. They typically arm themselves with needle-sharp darts that they can hurl a remarkable 360 feet. This is tremendous for something that size. How the hell they do this, nobody knows, but it might be some sort of a special snapping muscle and bone structure um, like a mantis shrimp. They also carry a tiny pike with a wicked serrated tip. Still, these only do one to two points of damage. They will hurt a fair bit, but the germline, because the germline have a habit of digging them right into the most sensitive parts of the ankle, or right between the toes, or into the palm of the hand, or the groin, or jab people in the side of the neck. Unlike mites and sniads, the bane midges are nasty little buggers. They will capture using lethal force, and there is a good chance that they will kill a victim in the process. They'll also always um, eat a murdered victim, and there's a slim chance that they will murder and eat a living captive, say like a 5% chance. Otherwise, they violently beat, rob, strip, and, interestingly, completely shave hairless their victim and dump them somewhere out in the open afterwards. Why they shave them, I do not know. Maybe to make clothes. They have the ability to cohabitate with rats, including giant rats, and are quite good at riding them. So you can usually find Jinxkin just about anywhere that you would find a rat. Their lairs are damn near impossible to navigate, and most of the passages are only a foot high. So good luck getting in there unless you're polymorphed or wild-shaped. The diet is an omnivorous mixture of insects, fresh meat, carrion, fungi, and molds. Uh, humanoids are a delicacy reserved for special occasions. Lizards form the bulk of their meat intake, and germline cherish foods from the surface. Even the hard tack and iron rations carried by adventurers are considered to be a, a bountiful feast, a delicacy. If the germline can identify which um, adventurers carry bags of food, these are stolen as enthusiastically as treasure pouches. And germline have a fondness for rarities such as sugar, candy, and preserved fruits. So you can leave little offerings of those to distract them. Such items can be used to entice normally malevolent germline to leave an adventure alone, at least temporarily. Germline are opportunistic brigands with a lot of in more intelligence, but even less size than mites and sniads, because they're actually distant relatives of gnomes who predated on unwary travellers in subterranean regions. Germlands are well aware of any such travellers um, moving through their area, including the party's size, composition, and general condition. They uh, Jinxkin could be persuaded for a suitable fee to share such knowledge with adventurers, um, and they may deal with giant folk, which means any race bigger than they are. If they're bribed or given access to, access to plentiful flow of victims or riches, they'll never ally themselves with truly good aligned adventurers, although they may, in a moment of craftiness, pretend to enter such an alliance, regardless of their spoken intentions. They'll usually either lie to or turn against their larger allies. This may, uh, They may make their lairs near the established territories of such races as drow, trolls, or troglodytes, although they're careful to avoid direct conflict with evil beings. The germline happily prey on the victims of their neighbours, as well as scavenging the scenes of their neighbours' battles. Uh, German land may um, actually act as watchmen for their neighbours and um, alert drow, for instance, if slaves have escaped and are moving through the area, uh, providing s provided suitable terms can be agreed upon for a reward. They unintentionally act as garbage men, cleaning the subterranean regions. Dead animals may um, be used as food or supplies, while dead humanoids are taken away to be searched for valuables or used as food and fed to their rats. Because of this, adventurers seeking the remains of a slain companion may seek out the local germlane since they may be aware of where the remains are located. Um, they may in fact hold them for ransom. Um, as a side note, Consider that the diminutive skulls, often seen as the buckles, belts, and weapons uh, ornaments of monstrous humanoids in some barbaric tribes, are actually the skulls of mites, sniads, and germline. 
and that these can be traded as a common currency where coins and gems are less acceptable. The tiny folk are not fey creatures, they will avoid portals. In fact, most magic scares them and they can be easily intimidated by displays of arcane power. Finally, they are fast breeders. They operate in tribes and clans, usually of significant numbers, which is the only, um, only reason, aside from their stealth and swiftness, that they can be a threat. And when faced with a band of 30 mites, difficult terrain, and hails of thrown rocks, or cracks from their little clubs, or pikes, spikes from their um, <laughs> pokes from their their spiky pikes. You can see how large monsters have reason to avoid towns full of regular sized humanoids. The mites, snyers, and jinx can maybe tiny, but they also can be annoyingly formidable on their own turf. Just a reminder: if you've not subscribed already, feel free to do so. Be sure to hit that notification bell as I upload from the other side of the world sometime in your future. For access to all the scripts and one week advanced access to these videos, consider becoming a patron of the channel on Patreon for a minimum just one dollar per month. Join the community on our Discord server. Come say hi. Please avoid um, our more outlandish conversations. Also, also, if you want to pick up a new video game at a significant daily discount and help me out in the process, check out the daily deal on Chrono. Link in the uh, below in the description of the description text. Also, there's some uh, merchandise which I'm slowly making and putting up for you if you want to buy something to support the channel and look cool on your desk or person. As always, thanks for listening, everyone. I'll be back with more for you very soon.